Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's budget hearing. My name is Mark Jaronai, and I am the Chair of Council's Committee on Small Business Services. We'll be joined by our fellow council members as well as the hearing continues. Today we bring, we will be hearing from the Department of Small Business Services and their fiscal 2020 preliminary budget that totals $174 million. It is the council's responsibility to ensure that the city budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to New Yorkers. Hence, as chair of the Small Business Services, I will continue to push for accountability and accuracy and ensure that the budget reflects the needs and interests of the city. The Department of Small Business Services fiscal 2020 preliminary budget totals $174 million, with $29 million proposed for personal services to support 331 full-time employees. The Department's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget is $110.9 million, or 38.9 percent less than the fiscal 2019 adopted budget of $284.7 million. This decreases in SBS's budget reflections reflects the $110.5 million decline in its other than personal services OTPS budget and 395,000 decline in the personal services PS budget. The rather larger decline in OTPS can be attributed to factors including 39.8 million in New York City school bus grant program not reflected in the budget and the reduction of funding for initiatives such as Love Your Local, MWBE Bond Security Fund, Career Pathways, Construction Safety Training, and Green Jobs Corps. I would like to I'd like the commissioner to provide the reasons for these decreases in a baseline budget and how the programs will be impacted due to the decrease. Additionally, I'd like the commissioner to explain the impending increases that we may see in the executive budget in May. One concern I have is the headcount for the agency. The department's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget includes a net decrease of 45 full-time positions when compared to the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. The decrease in budgeted headcount is due to the addition of nine new positions offset by a decrease of 54 positions. Please explain the decline in headcount and the services that will be impacted by this decrease. Another big concern I have is that the agency's actual headcount every month in the fiscal 2019 has been over 101 less than what is in the plan. I'd like to hear from SBS today the reasons why the agency has such a high vacancy rate and whether these funds can be redistributed to programs where there is a need for expansion. I'd like the commissioner to share with us how the agency plans to meet the mayor's peg target of 6.24 percent of the agency's budget which amounts to $7.4 million. Does the agency believe that this is a realistic target? Did OMB work with the agency to come up with this target? How will this affect services provided by the agency? It is essential that the budget that we adopt this year is transparent, accountable, and reflective of the priorities and the interests of the Council and the people we represent. This hearing is a vital part of the process and I expect that SBS will be responsive to the questions and concerns of the council members. I look forward to an active engagement with the administration over the next few months to ensure that the fiscal 2020 adopted budget meets the goals the council has set out. I'd like to thank the Commissioner Bishop for coming here today and testifying. I'd like to thank the SBS staff who have consistently been responsive to our many requests. We would not be able to analyze the city's budget at such a detailed level without your cooperation, so thank you. I would also like to thank both my staff and the staff of the Finance Division, Aliyah Ali and Krillian Francisco, for their help in preparing this hearing. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the terrible tra tragedy that occurred in New Zealand. Uh, our prayers are with New Zealand, the citizens of New Zealand, the families, and all the victims that were involved. Thank you. 
Uh, please raise your right hand if you're planning on testifying. Um, repeat after me. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Cool. Uh, please state your name for the record as well. Thank you. Oh, either. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, and um, uh, thank you for those words, uh, Chair Joan. I, um, uh, it is, it is a, a very difficult time when we see hate um, having such a, a force in this world, so I, I really thank you for acknowledging that. Um, good afternoon, Chair Jonai and, and members of the Committee on Small Business. Uh, my name is Greg Bishop, and I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Small Business Services. I'm joined by SBS First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mellon and my senior leadership team. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I will share updates on our efforts to achieve this aim over the last year, and after my testimony, I'm happy to take your questions. First, I'd like to give you an overview of our agency budget. From there, I will discuss the services made possible through this funding. SBS fiscal year 20 preliminary budget is $174 million with a head count of 331 employees. The preliminary budget includes pass-through funding that is not spent or managed by SBS, but is used as a conduit funding for other city entities. Of the 174 million, 34% or 58.5 million is pass-through funding, which includes 21 million for the New York City Economic Development Corporation, 21.1 million for NYC and Company, and 14.9 million for Governor's Island, and 1.4 million for the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. The remaining 115.6 million, or 66% of the fiscal year 20 preliminary budget, is allocated for SBS's program. This funding supports SBS's mission of economically empowering New Yorkers through our employment, business, and neighborhood services. As you know, small businesses are essential to the local economy and character of our neighborhoods. They provide opportunities for individuals to strengthen their own economic security and provide jobs for members of their communities. SBS operates a network of seven NYC Business Solution Centers that provide free, high-quality services to help small businesses start, operate, and grow. These centers are at the core of our business support strategy and offer services including access to capital, MWB certification, navig navigating government regulations, and workforce recruitment. In fiscal year 2018, SBS's NYC Business Solutions Center served almost 10,000 unique businesses. To assist industrial and manufacturing businesses, SBS contracts with nine industrial business service providers, or IBSPs, and in fiscal year 2018, the IBSPs connected more than 400 unique businesses to nearly 800 services. Earlier this week, SBS announced the successful implementation of the 30 commitments that compromise Small Business First, or SB1. SB1 is a set of interagency policy and procedural changes that reduce the regulatory burden on small businesses and increase compliance. This includes the NYC Business Portal, an online resource where business owners can look up which license and permit their specific business needs, view their interactions with the city, and learn how to avoid common business violations. Since the portal was launched last year, more than 24,000 accounts have been created, and we have seen an average of 1.5 million unique visitors per year. Through SB1, we continue to refine the portal and provide direct support to business owners through compl the Compliance Advisors Program, which has provided on-site compliance cons consultations to more than 5,000 businesses. The implementation of SB1's 30 commitments is expected to decrease the time to complete common business transactions by 30% and save businesses $50 million annually. Along with regulatory reform, SBS helps longstanding businesses adapt to changing market conditions. Through the first round of the Love Your Local grant program, SBS awarded up to $90,000 in funding to 20 small businesses. This initiative will enable SBS to test and analyze creative business interventions with the aim of expanding effective solutions to other longstanding businesses across the five boroughs. Since launching last year, our commercial lease assistance program has provided eligible businesses with legal services on topics including lease negotiations, formalizing oral lease agreements and landlord harassment. The commercial lease assistance program has shown strong performance in serving small business owners that have historically lacked access to quality services. Of the more than 200 businesses served through the program, 80% are minority owned, 60% are immigrant owned, and nearly half are owned by women. 
This year, SBS strengthened our WeNYC program by launching new initiatives to help address the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship gender gap with a focus on underserved communities. We Legal now hosts clinics for women entrepreneurs for ac for, to access free one-on-one -on -one legal consultations. During these consultations, attorneys provide business owners with legal advice regarding business formation, drafting bylaws and contracts, and other corporate legal matters. We NYC's new capital access program, We Fund Growth, is a targeted growth is a targeted loan program that makes more than five million in capital accessible to women entrepreneurs looking to grow their businesses. Earlier this month, we also announced We Credit, which helps women entrepreneurs access lines of credit to start, grow, and sustain their businesses. These new programs build on the existing mentorship, education, and community resources available by WeNYC, which has served more than 6,000 New Yorkers since its launch in 2015. We also play a key role in the city's minority and women-owned business enterprise program, or the MWBE program. The MWBE program aims to support the growth of minority and women-owned businesses through city procurement, ensuring that our vendors reflect the diversity of our city. SBS certifies MWBEs, provide essential capacity billing services, and offers technical assistance to help MWBs compete for and execute city contracts. To date, SBS has certified more than 7,100 MWBs, a nearly 96% increase since the start of the administration. This year, SBS launched a new online application portal to further streamline the certification process. And Mayor de Blasio also recently announced that the city has awarded more than $10 billion to MWBs since 2015. For certified MWBEs, cash flow is often an issue for companies working on city projects. So this administration created a contract financing loan fund. This $10 million revolving fund lets small businesses borrow up to a million dollars, capped at a 3% interest rate. And since the fund launched in 2017, SBS has awarded loans worth more than $9 million, opening the door to more than $52 million in contracts for small businesses. SBS also provides support for everyday New Yorkers to gain new skills and connect to living wage jobs. We focus on growing sectors in, the, in our economy and prepare New Yorkers to seize those opportunities. SBS assists job seekers with a wide range of skill sets, skill levels through an inclusive growth strategy that ensures community members, employers, and education institutions are aligned to increase the number of local residents prepared for and getting good jobs. Through our network of 18 Workforce One career centers, SBS connects job seekers with employment opportunities, industry-informed trainings, and a variety of candidate development services, such as resume development, interview preparation, and job search workshops. Annually, we connect more than 25,000 New Yorkers to employment and nearly 4,000 New Yorkers with the training needed to advance their careers. Through our industry, in our industry partnerships, SBS works collaboratively with in industry to invest in local talent in the food service, industrial, construction, healthcare, and tech sectors. Examples of industry partnership initiatives that are supported by our budget include job quality programs in home health care and efforts to bring top tech talent from the private industry to teach at local CUNY colleges. In addition, employers from the industry partnerships are leading the charge on a new way to hire local talent. Through Apprentice NYC, employer partners have hired New Yorkers in fields as diverse as nursing, computer numerical control or CNC machinists, and software and mobile engineering, and have provided, provided them with the training and mentoring needed to succeed. The funding in SBS's budget will help spread and scale this new way of identifying and onboarding talent across New York City. For example, this budget will support the expansion of our city, citywide nurse residency to 24 local hospitals, providing 500 nurses with year-long residencies that include specialized training to bridge the gap between education and practice. The citywide nurse residency launched this year is the nation's first city-led nurse residency program. Using the industry knowledge gained from our, our employers, SBS works with provider partners, including tech boot camps and community-based organizations, to create industry-informed trainings across multiple career pathways. In the healthcare sector, we support trainings for workers in home health care, medical assisting, and nursing, providing a variety of entry points and advancement opportunities for New Yorkers with different levels of experience. We work closely with neighborhood community groups to recruit for all 28 trainings SBS offers across the many sectors we focus on to ensure local residents are able to easily access these opportunities. 
In alignment and support of the administration's vision of equity of opportunity, we have developed bridge programs and tailored employment services. For example, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and community-based organizations, we created unique employment and training services tailored to the strengths and needs of immigrant New Yorkers. These programs include bilingual medical assisting training, bridge to tech, and preparation for nursing for foreign trained nurses. Similarly, we work with youth education partners, including the Department of Education, Career, and Technical Education, and District 79, to create a suite of employment and training services to support young adults. These efforts include co-location at our West Farms Workforce One Career Center in the Bronx that allows young adults to combine work and school and access bridge programs in transportation, healthcare, and tech. The expertise of local underground partners is essential to addressing the unique challenges faced by New York City's diverse neighborhoods and businesses. SBS oversees the largest network of business improvement districts in the country, with 76 bids delivering more than $159 million in services to 93,000 businesses throughout the five boroughs. SBS provides the bid network and other community development organizations with technical assistance, grant opportunities, and capacity building services, further strengthening the direct connection between our agency and our local small businesses. To increase the capacity of our community partner network, SBS developed the Neighborhood 360 Fellows Program. The Neighborhood 360 Fellows Program pairs 10 paid full-time neighborhood development specialists with 10 community-based organizations. The program not only provides local organizations with dedicated support for commercial revitalization projects, but also builds a pipeline of diverse talent in the neighborhood development field. SBS works with community partners to identify the needs of local commercial district and plan targeted solutions through our commercial district needs assessments, or CDNAs. CDNAs identify the strengths, challenges, and opportunities within a commercial corridor to better inform subsequent investments. To date, SBS has worked with community partners to publish 10 CDNAs, and in 2018, SBS shifted the focus of our Avenue NYC grant program from project-based awards to long-term commitments. Avenue NYC enables awardees to hire a full-time program manager, conduct a CDNA, and implement programming based on findings. Nine additional CDNAs are being conducted through the Avenue NYC grants awarded in 2018. To expand SBS reach beyond our physical centers and network of community partners, we are committed to conducting outreach through the five boroughs to raise awareness of our services among business owners and job seekers. Through the support of council, our Chamber on the Go initiative allows us to send trained business specialists to canvas commercial corridors and connect with business owners. Since launching in December 2015, Chamber on the Go has reached almost 13,000 businesses directly at their doorsteps. In 2017, SBS launched an additional outreach tool, a mobile outreach unit. Equipped with classroom space and computers, SBS staff use the mobile outreach unit to provide on-site referrals to our free business services, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with MW certification applications, resources during an emergency, and, requirement and recruitment events to connect job seekers with employment opportunities. I look forward to the continued partnership of the committee in building a more vibrant and inclusive economy as we expand the reach of SBS programs to more New Yorkers. Thank you, and I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, in my opening statement, I asked that you Provide the reasons for the decrease in the baseline budget and how the programs will be impacted due to the decrease. So, for uh, you had, uh, there was a couple of uh, uh, questions you had with uh, construction safety, uh, the decrease in construction safety, and also career pathways. Um, so, we are continuously uh, working with OMB uh, to ensure um, that we have um, our services are, are, uh, will continue. Um, construction safety, as you, I don't know if you may recall, last year we were just building the program. Um, so the decreases that you're seeing is that as we have advanced um, in, in terms of uh, designing and building the program, uh, some of those dollars have shifted over to OTPS uh, because we are working with uh, community partners uh, to actually do the work that we had as originally assumed uh, internally that city employees would do. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I just want to note that we've also been uh, joined by Councilmember Perkins. As part of the FY19 budget process, 
OMB directed your agency to find 2% efficiency savings. At last year's hearings, you weren't prepared to outline where those cuts would be. Did you, uh, in fact, implement those 2% savings last year? If so, can you please elaborate on where you made those cuts? So, um, yeah, so there's a combination of um, either uh, existing programs um, uh, and PS, uh, and PS savings. Um, I don't have the, I don't know if we have um, the exact areas, uh, but typically when we are looking for savings, um, it, it's either we take a, a broad uh, a stroke in terms of uh, evenly cut uh, all the different programs, uh, or we take it in specific areas uh, where either we're launching a program and uh, we're not able to launch exactly on time, so there's savings there that we're able to uh, realize. This is important because as you look to make deeper peg cuts, this will give us insight on your agency's priorities. And it's quite concerning uh, on the, the depth of these cuts. Can you elaborate at all on where you project these cuts may be coming from? What areas they may hit and how you plan on meeting the objectives? So right now we're, 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 we have a, a mandatory savings target of 6.2 million. Uh, so for FY19 it's 3% and then in FY20 it's uh, 2%. Um, so we are working closely with, with OMB to identify those areas. Uh, the, the guiding principle is that we are looking not to either lay off employees or cut any of our services. Um, so a typical example may be um, looking at a contract and instead of having um, you know, if we have a, a particular program, uh, that program may not uh, reoccur in every two weeks, it could be every three weeks. Uh, so we're trying to figure out ways that we do not have um, uh, an actual uh, substantial impact on service delivery. So as of right now, we are uh, in ongoing co communications with OMB. We have not identified uh, specific areas as of yet. It's interesting that you noted uh, that the cuts will not be to staff, uh, which then opens up the question to the headcount. In fiscal 2019, the agency's actual headcount every month has over 100 less than what is in the plan. Why do you have such high vacancies? And if you're not looking to cut from the staff budget, why are we over projecting the needs of staff? Right. So on, on paper, uh, and I do understand, and we, we had a, 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 a very uh, deep Passionate. Conversation, <laughs> conversation about vacancy. Um, and on paper, even though you see trending uh, about 100 vacancies, as you know, we at SBS, usually we, we either have new programs coming on, uh, and we have, uh, if we have a vacancy, we'll fill it, but then in another area, we'll have a vacancy. So, so even though the numbers look the same, uh, in the natural turn of and, and um, of hiring and people uh, finding new opportunities, uh, that number has been, and I will admit, uh, stubbornly at a hundred. Uh, but some of them, some of that is because we've uh, inherited new programs uh, that we now have to hire into. Uh, some of it is that we've had in, 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 uh, individuals who have taken other opportunities. Uh, you know, I will tell you that the hundred that you've seen that you saw the last time we were together, are, they're not the same people. Um, so what we have done is, you know, I've beefed up in, internally in my human resources uh, department. Uh, we've had an additional recruiter um, uh, to actually help, uh, help us with, um, you know, uh, figuring out different ways we can find uh, individuals uh, to fill these positions. Uh, we do have about 26 or 27 um, uh, hires that are waiting for uh, budget approval. Uh, so we are making progress, um, but we are uh, looking at other ways that we can uh, increase our recruiting uh, um, ability to actually fill these positions. Uh, but again, in, when we get new programs, it increases the vacancy count because we have to then build out that program. Thank you for that, Commissioner. But the percentage is nearly 30% of your total staff that you uh, indicate are needed for SBS to 
operate all of its programs. Um, how many positions do you currently have that are vacant of the projected, and I'm, I'm guessing we're gonna use the head count of 360, is that the number that we're looking at yeah, now? So if you're using 360, which is December, um, so for, for January, so for December, the vacant, the vacant count is 101, uh, but in January, um, you know, we're at 96, and then if you subtract the um, higher, the um, offer letters that we have out right now, uh, which is about 26 out of that 96, uh, that brings it down to about 70, um, and we're making progress there. So, you know, again, we, we want to, um, I, I totally understand, you know, on paper how it looks, and, and you know, uh, I will remind you as well, you know, one of the things that we are, are, are struggling with is that we do have a robust economy. Uh, we are a small agency. Uh, sometimes our salaries are not as competitive. Um, I see this in, for example, in, um, uh, you know, in different areas uh, where we have individuals who, uh, you know, have worked with us for a little bit and uh, they get a better offer uh, in the private sector or in, at another larger agency. Uh, so it's a constant battle in terms of uh, when we make the hires and keeping people um, on board um, and then, you know, um, uh, ensuring that they stay on. Can you please elaborate a little bit for us when you say salaries that you're not as competitive as the open markets? What are the base salaries that many of these positions fall in? Are we looking at minimum wage paying jobs? Or oh, no, 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 no. So, for example, um, I, I would give you, a, 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 so a program manager, average salary at, at SBS is probably about 50 uh, to 60,000, um, whereas at a larger agency, it could be 80, 90,000. Um, so, you know, we have a, a pay disparity um, only because of our size. Uh, but there are, you know, but there are things that we do. Uh, we try to recruit in different areas, uh, for example, uh, looking at different colleges. Um, you know, I, I try to poach from other agencies uh, by talking about not necessarily the salary, but the culture of the SBS. And how the privilege great it is. of working with you. <laughs> and how great it <laughs> is to like work that. at SBS. Um, but I do uh, recognize that uh, throughout last year, we have really tried to bring this number down. I think, you know, if you look at the, um, uh, on paper, even though there's, as of January, there's 96 vacancies, with the offer letters we have, we're down to about 70, and we continue, we have a new recruiter uh, who's actively working on, um, you know, finding us individuals who, uh, would actually um, be eligible and want to work for the city. So uh, I'm glad that you've taken the initiative of hiring a, a recruiter. How else are you promoting these opportunities and careers? Uh, how are we getting a word out there? What? So there's there's a number of ways we've done it. Um, we're doing it. So we actually created a new um, recruiting video, uh, for example. Uh, so at our last uh, all staff meeting, uh, we had staff members talk about why it's so great to work at SBS. Uh, so that we will use on social media. Um, we've already posted it on LinkedIn. Uh, we do have uh, relationships, like I said, with uh, colleges and uh, universities and other different uh, job sites. Uh, word of mouth is probably the best way possible to actually help us with um, getting uh, these positions filled. Uh, but also in, in some of these positions, uh, they're highly technical. Uh, so for example, uh, we have a waterfront unit um, and that waterfront unit requires a special skill set uh, where uh, it is a very competitive market. Uh, so similar to other agencies that have uh, spe uh, highly specialized uh, skilled positions, uh, we are competing in those areas, so it's taken us longer to find and fill those, those particular positions. And I believe that you're also uh, posting these positions at uh, your website? Oh, I, oh, yeah, that was, that was a given. Yes, so we have it not only on our website, but also on the New York City Careers website. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, and we also work with the Office of Appointments uh, for, you know, the, the higher level positions. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, extended the, the net as wide as possible. Uh, but again, even though those numbers have been stubborn for the past fiscal year, um, they don't represent the same position. Uh, so we would fill one position, and then in another area, another position would get vacated, and then we would go through the whole cycle again in terms of recruiting, making the offer, and getting the approval, and then having the person start. 
So roughly the 100 is, you have 25 now that are going through the process of being retained, uh, hired, and Correct. until that's done, they're still listing the positions as available. So back to the 100 with the 25 right. that are currently going through the hiring stages. Correct, so if you're using, so right now, as of January, I know in your, your packet you have 101, which is at the end of December, but as of the end of January, we have 96 vacancies, and of those 96, we have about 20, 25, 20, 25 in um, pipelines. We've made offers uh, to those, so they're going through the process of, of getting hired. Um, so that, that's, that's, where we're, that's where we're at with the 96 with the offers until they accept and... Correct, and I will not remove, uh, they, they've already accepted, but until they actually start, we won't remove um, the job opening uh, because in case something happens and it's happened before where someone else gets a counter offer and they rescind the acceptance, uh, we need to, uh, as quickly as possible, get another person in. Great. And this leads me to my question. On the careers that are posted on your own website, you don't have 100 positions or 96 or 71 for that matter being posted. You have less than 40 positions posted as available. Well, I, I would have to take a look at it. There, there should be, um, it, it all depends on, on where we are in the process, so I, I would have to take a look at what's, what's up on, on the website and what's, um, what we have available. Right, real-time information I'm sure is going to help fill those much needed vacancies so we can op operate at an optimal level. Uh, thank you for the explanations, uh, Commissioner. I don't know if, uh, great. So uh, my colleague will think about the questions and I get to continue questioning um, on the budget. Elaborate between this preliminary budget and what you expect to happen in a final, um, adopted budget. Do you foresee restorations of the, of the, of the large cuts coming into play? Um, are we going to be getting a much different budget to adopt in the near future? Uh, I, I will say that, the, the, as you know, the school bus grant program, um, uh, typically we work with, and in this case, because uh, we have a new state legislature, um, we're hoping that this may be the, the last year that uh, this program um, uh, uh, will be, SBS will be uh, working uh, as, a, as a fiscal conduit for this program. But um, uh, that usually happens uh, later on um, at, in terms of negotiations. Um, and then of course, uh, Career Pathways, which, is, uh, which funds a lot of the work that I talked about in workforce. Uh, we are working uh, with OMB to ensure the continuation of those services. So why not put them in the preliminary budget now? Why do we leave them as add-ons for later on, knowing that we're hoping that they'll be? So those two particular areas, I think, you know, for workforce, there's a larger con conversation happening uh, citywide about our investments in workforce. Uh, those conversations are ongoing, which is why it, we couldn't put it in the preliminary. Um, and then the school bus grant program, again, it goes back to, um, depending on what happens on, at the state level, uh, and uh, if, if the law, if, if the employee protections are passed on the state level, uh, then it allows DOE to do whatever they need to do, and then they don't need this program. So there's the, the, there's the uncertainty that prevents it from uh, being in the preliminary budget, and during preliminary and exec, there's these conversations that happen, uh, which is why you see sometimes the changes. So we, ha we know that we're, we're gonna have some type of additions added to the preliminary budget. At the same time, the peg of 6.24%, which is a concern, how realistic is your peg uh, expectations, first of all? Do you think you'll achieve the, the percentage that uh, OMB has set for you? I, I I don't know if, I, I mean, I have to say, when you say do you think, I mean, OMB has told us we need to. So uh, we are now working with them to figure out where we are going to find those savings. Um, and uh, we work very closely with OMB. Uh, so uh, looking at different programs and, you know, um, where, uh, again, the guiding principle is uh, 
uh, focus on ensuring the continuity of services without impacting um, the delivery of those services. So we will, you know, work closely with, with OMB uh, to figure out the best places to make those cuts. But have, have as far as I know, we, uh, you know, uh, OMB has said we need to uh, demonstrate these savings. Have you had those conversations yet, or is that in the future? The uh, conversations is ongoing. Uh, so we started the conversations, and we are continuously working with, o with OMB to identify uh, the areas where um, uh, we can realize those savings. Maybe I can help you. Um, what is the budgeted line item for SB1? I don't think you're going to find it in the report. It's, it's a combination of uh, a couple initiatives. No. My recollection is it's $9 million a year. So it's a com so SB1 is a combination. Remember, so there's part of it is uh, our center out in uh, Queens. Uh, part of it is uh, working uh, with uh, uh, designing and building the portal. So it's it's about about 400 in what's that 420 thousand a year. No. No. I thought the SB1 uh, budget. Line item was about nine million because it was for three years, twenty-seven million uh, over the last three years, and now we're in year four. Um, and according to our, the hearing we had in two thousand and eighteen, we had these passionate discussions about the SB one factor and the intent of the program. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should start with that first, but while they look into the numbers. So is, can you remind us all what the purpose of SB1 was? Right. So, and, and that, that, that will explain why the numbers have lowered, uh, because the, it, it initially uh, SB1 um, was a, a cross-agency effort uh, to make it easier for businesses uh, not only uh, to be in compliance with the regulatory environment, uh, but also to make it more transparent. Uh, so there's a number of initiatives that came out of that, about 30, and we recently announced that we just completed them. Uh, part of the funding was actually to build out the portal uh, that we talked about. Uh, so uh, the portal is not just a website that a uh, business owner will just log in, uh, but that portal took aggregated information from all the different agencies, um, not, you know, from 311, from fire, uh, from health, um, Every single agency, DCA, any single agency that interacts with the business, uh, we were able to take data uh, that, w that we thought was important for businesses to be aware of and make it more transparent. Uh, so that involved a, a, a very large uh, technology effort. Um, and that also in the budget included building and testing out a one-stop center. Uh, so having the ability for business owners to go to just one facility uh, so that's our center out in uh, on Southern Boulevard in Queens, uh, so where we're co-located uh, with uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, where business owners will go in and get just, um, if they have a license issue, uh, they can go to DCA. If they have an issue uh, with other agency, they can come to us, uh, and everything, uh, all the services are delivered there. So now the ongoing dollars that we have in our budget is to actually maintain that particular center, um, and then continuing looking at other areas and, and refining uh, the portal. Uh, so, for example, if you log into the portal um, and, uh, you know, there's ongoing enhancements, uh, that's what the budget will um, be responsible for. All right. Thank you for that, Commissioner. So aside from the portal, I believe the objective was to also um, identify rules and regulations. Uh, you had 30 points. Um, on helping businesses and to comply with city regulations. And we've been going back and forth for the last year. Uh, the only numbers that I have from the Red Tape Commission were 6,000 rules and regulations. On numerous occasions, SBS um, said it's 5,300. And I says, okay, I'm willing to accept any number. Just show me the actual rules and regulations. And I believe that was part of SB1's intention. Um, 
and I believe point number nine was deploy small business compliance advisors to help businesses follow the rules, right? So I think the problem was how do we help them follow the rules if we don't even know what the rules are because we don't even know what the real number is, let alone which rules and regulations our business have to comply with. We do. Oh, we do. So, so I, I would say that, uh, and I know we go back and forth. So I guess the, the what we could offer up is um, if the portal is not um, in, uh, I guess, in a way, if it doesn't display the rules and regs in a way that you think would be helpful to small businesses, uh, we are certainly open to figure out ways we can improve it. Uh, what we did was use a data-driven approach. Uh, so we worked with all the regulatory agencies and also the mayor's office of operations. We looked at the most common violations uh, that businesses are, um, uh, were being fined for, uh, and then we created a couple tools. One, we created a most common violation tool. So again, I just want to reiterate the, the 5,000, the numbers that you have, uh, those are just rules. Uh, some of them affect businesses, some of them don't affect businesses. Uh, if, obviously, you know that if you're opening up a retail store, uh, the rules and licenses that you are responsible for is totally different uh, than if you're opening up an auto repair shop or if you're dealing with uh, hazardous chemicals uh, or if you're just opening up a parlor. Uh, there, there's different rules that's associated with that. So uh, the 5,000 doesn't apply to just that retail store. Uh, that retail store may just have like one or two. Uh, what we have done is that if you are op thinking about open up a retail store, uh, you will actually tell us what you plan to do in that premises, uh, and then the, the tool will actually tell you uh, of the city rules what you are responsible for. Uh, we also, if you have a store in existence, uh, for example, a restaurant, et cetera, you can go to the most common violation and see the areas, uh, because we have that data, uh, where most businesses have been fined. Um, so again, uh, we have gone back and forth a couple times about this. Uh, I would uh, be happy to, to uh, work with your team, uh, you know, go through the portal, uh, and you tell us where, you know, because the reason why we built the portal the way we did is when we went out uh, initially, uh, we talked to businesses. We talked to over 600 business owners, and the, the points that we came up with was what the business owners said were the most common issues uh, that they were struggling with. Um, so uh, we can do that again um, and actually talk to business owners, uh, have them use the portal, tell us what they think so far. Uh, some of the enhancements we've made already um, from hearing, uh, for example, restaurants, uh, not knowing how many 311 violations they've, uh, complaints they've had until they go to in front of a community board to get their liquor license re uh, renewed. Uh, so that information is now in the portal, uh, as an example. Uh, so we just want to, um, you know, maybe figure out ways we can make it easier for you uh, and the business community. Uh, we think the business community um, uh, uh, appreciates the portal, uh, but if it's not the, the list that you're looking for, then we're happy to figure out a way to, to help you get that list. All right, so I'll just make one point then, and I, and I truly understand that you're taking this from the approach of based on information of the violations and the most frequent. So typically it was the top 10 violations by agency or department, and your doesn't count for number 11. Which brings me to something that's interesting, because for the last year, for tooth and nail, when SBN was, SB1 was launched, there were 50 calls that came in on 311 on complaints of illegal store signs. Hmm. As of close of SB1, there were 400 calls that were coming in through 311 on illegal store signs. Yet, SB1 never picked up on this incredible violation and weaponizing of 311 that was targeting businesses, which ranged from $5,000 to $20,000 per store. How could we miss that? This is what SB1 was created to do. So I would say, so SBO was, was created to address the most common violations. I think in, in that particular, er, in that particular um, scenario, uh, I would say that, you know, we, 
worked with the local community. So um, it, this this weaponizing of 311 started happening in uh, one of uh, the council member uh, uh, Espinal's, um, Espinal's district. Um, so we started the conversation about what was happening. Um, and I would say that, you know, we worked really hard uh, with our partner agency. Uh, we worked really hard with you um, and with other council members. Uh, part of it was working with council to reduce the fines uh, that you, that council uh, actually created uh, for particular violations. Um, I still hope that we can continue working uh, to, because uh, one of the things that we found out from this issue, from this area, uh, was the cost of installing signs. Um, because I know a lot of small businesses complain not only about not only about um, the fines, but also about the cost of hiring a licensed sign installer. Um, and it was my hope that we would actually be able to increase the pool of licensed sign installers to reduce that cost. Um, and I still hope that we can uh, we can do that. Um, but uh, you know, SB1 uh, again, when we look at the most common violations, we look at things um, that um, the agencies uh, uh, normally look for uh, when they're doing an inspection. Uh, this sign issue was uh, was driven by complaints. Um, so. You know, one of the things that we do have, again, like as I said, with, with the restaurants, uh, when you have a complaint against your premise through 311, that will bring a, 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 a business owner can log in and actually see what that looks like. Thank you, Commissioner. But the, I believe the number was in the thousands of violations that were issued for illegal signs. There was media attention on this. We had hearings on this. I kept screaming it from the rooftops that we were destroying small businesses and forcing them out of business. Yet, using the portal, I don't see that right. warning requirement anywhere posted, which impacts every single business. Specifically, and I just want to reiterate on something that you mentioned, that this was a council policy. This administration removed the moratorium that was placed on the signage law and for a number of years was benefited from the thousands of violations that were issued. It took us nine months of pressure to have a moratorium restored, a piece of legislation introduced that allows us to go back and revisit the law to bring it up to code, up to, this, the code dates back to 1961, and I'll remind you, said no more than 12 square foot of print, which didn't leave room for a phone number, let alone describing the products or the services that you uh, are offering to the public. But in the regulation, that in the bill that we just put into law, there's a budget to fulfill SBS's commitment to the now awning law, which I don't even see in your preliminary budget. You were supposed to be refunding some of these stores for the violations they received over the last year, I believe. And that's not reflected in your budget. I and I don't see it even listed anywhere on SBS's website where those business owners that were subjected to these ridiculous fines for an outdated law that shouldn't be on the books mm -hmm. for them to get that information. So it's just not about making sure that we inform our small businesses of the laws that they're supposed to be complying with, but also something as significant as this bill, which put businesses out of business, that they could recoup and get a refund for those violations so uh so a couple things uh the the refund of an uh, uh the refund of to businesses would not be um in our budget if anything um, it would be in the budget of the agency that actually uh, is collecting the fines um i would say that you know i hear you in terms of how did how, oh sorry 
how, how did, um, you know, SB1, there's, at our agency, we have a combination of things, right? We're using technology, uh, we're using people. Um, so when we found out about the sign issue, uh, this was more of, and we've had conversation, I had conversations with you, I had conversations with my counterparts on, on the administration side. Uh, we were working uh, to address this issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the portal uh, would help a business owner understand uh, what exactly what interactions they would have with the city. Um, we, on, uh, you know, when we look at the most common violations, uh, this is an anomaly. Uh, and, I, and, and an anomaly, we wouldn't depend on technology to address, we would actually address uh, with actual people. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, we had individuals, uh, we had our compliance advisors uh, go out and actually understand what the problem was, uh, help business owners understand what they need. Uh, we talked uh, to um, our counterparts at the Department of Buildings, we talked to council, uh, we talked to Deputy Mayor of Operations, uh, and I think that's how we were able to get to the point where we were able to pass the legislation to address uh, that particular issue. Uh, my reference to council was only on uh, the schedule, the fine schedule for the different uh, types of violations. But, that, but it's that also was, uh, awareness and education at SB1 and what SBS is supposed to be offering? So our compliance advisors, when we go out, we do help business owners understand what, the, what they are responsible for. For example, if you're a restaurant, uh, what would the health department look for? If you're a retail store, what would consumer affairs look for? Um, you know, what would sanitation look for? Um, so having um, awareness of the fact, and I think we do have on our portal, if you have a sign, you need to have a permit for that sign. I think that the, the challenge is, is that there are some business owners, as you know, uh, who inherited the business, um, and that sign has been up for like 30 years. Uh, 50. Or 50 years. Um, and that is something, you know, it would have to be like an in-person um, we'd have to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think technology would have solved that problem at all. Techno using technology, we could have made our business owners, and especially those that receive these fines, aware that they are entitled to a refund for those uh, fines. Um, and I view the role, and I know, Commissioner, that you're just as passionate as I am about small businesses. And it's about making sure that the facts change. And those facts are 50% of small businesses close within the first five years. They never make it to year five. And if you're in the restaurant industry, it's 80% don't make it to year five. That's not in our best interest. No, you it's, I, and I totally agree. I, I mean, you know, a lot of why our core services, uh, when we talk about our NYC business solutions, a lot of our core services focus on ensuring uh, that that business owners, that business owner has all the tools necessary to succeed. Uh, so from everything from understanding how to grow that business, so we have classes um, on how to uh, fast track, for example, growth venture, uh, where you learn about how to grow your business, how to use technology uh, to, um, you know, because consumer behavior is changing. Uh, using a restaurant as an example, if you open up a restaurant and you don't have an online presence, uh, you're, you're almost destined to fail uh, because everyone is using some type of app to buy food from that restaurant. Uh, so we have programs where uh, business owner, owners understand how to display uh, their business online, um, how to actually have e-commerce, um, you know, uh, and, 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 and also how to actually uh, recruit the right set of employees. Um, you know, we work closely with business owners to also understand, uh, for example, Lovely Local is a good example, uh, where one of the findings we found with the first batch of businesses that we did an analysis, a lot of business owners did not have a, um, an inventory management system. Uh, so that, because we know that information now going forward, um, as we get the results from the other analysis, uh, that will help us uh, adapt and innovate our, our education offerings to make sure that we are offering uh, the tools necessary for businesses to be successful now. Commissioner, thank you. I, I'm looking, I don't want to make this all about that, but I just, uh, that's a fine example of where SB1 has plenty of room to improve. Um, I, and while we're looking to help them keep their doors open and making sure that they're in compliance, for some of these businesses, just receiving a notice or 
and being informed that you you may have paid between five thousand and twenty thousand, and we're sending you a check, can make a difference whether or not they stay in business. It can give them the oxygen that they need, so badly need, today, so they can be there tomorrow. But you brought up an interesting point as we continue. Last year's budget hearing, you acknowledged that the SBS was developing a survey on businesses that was required by law to be reported to the council by 2019. It's 2019. Yet we haven't seen this report, and last year I offered in advance I wanted to be a part of the survey, the questions, and engage to make sure that it was a well-balanced survey. Can you update us on where we are? So, uh, from my understanding, the the, the um, piece of legislation um, it's 2019, uh, but we are in a it's not due like the first quarter of 2019. Um, we are in the process of collecting data uh, as we speak. Um, so, as far as I know, we are on target to actually meet the delivery date. I never saw the survey in itself. I asked for it a number of times. We, we said we before the survey was to be sent out and used. I was informed that, yes, Mark, you'll have a chance to review it and uh, make sure that uh, there's nothing that we missed or if you have any input. Uh, I would have really have loved to have been a part of that process. Remember, I come from the small business world and just perhaps I could have added something to it. I never was afforded the opportunity as small business chair. So I'm not sure what happened there, but I mean, we'd be happy to share with you that survey. and. Again, as we compile the report, uh, we can, uh, because that's just one of the areas we, you know, whether we survey or we have um, uh, focus groups to finalize the report, uh, we'd be happy to work with you on that. So uh, just from looking at last year's uh, budget hearing and the response from you is, so as you know that the law requires us to have that report to the council by 2019. We're in the process of actually creating the questions and we'll, blank, 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 we're on, the, on track to get that survey out by the summer or fall. Made requests, haven't seen, haven't heard. We're in 2019 and I'm still not right. aware if the survey was ever sent out. And well, I just, it's disturbing, that's all. I'm bringing out another point of how collectively we can work much better. And I truly see you and view you as a partner. I believe we I have do that, the same. that you see me uh, as a partner. I am truly afraid for the future of small businesses, in particular micro businesses. And you highlighted this with consumer behavior changes, competition from box stores and chains, and the internet, which has undermined most business models. On top of the forced mandates of minimum wage increases, paid family leave, health care coverages, sick leave, on top of the real estate tax increases, the burdens of water and sewer rate increases, as well as the rules and regulations, we have really stacked the deck against small business in every manner possible. And that chokehold is continuing. There is no intention of letting up. In this budget alone, there is a $1.8 billion increase in real estate taxes that will be passed on to each one of those small businesses. Commissioner, I know your passion. And this budget is really important that we offer the programs and the services that our small businesses need. And this has nothing to do with profits or greed. For them to remain open, once that business is closed, and we see the vacancy increases throughout our commercial corridors, and I want to go on a record on this one, we see a disaster ahead when it comes to the number of vacancies, and it has nothing to do with rent. The amount of square footage of vacancies that will be coming up in the near future, 
from just two industries are going to have a tremendous impact on all of our commercial corridors. That is the banking industry that occupies every corner of almost every commercial corridor in New York City. When they go full online service only with kiosks, for local branches or the safety deposit or just bo drop boxes where there is no need for uh, the brick and mortar service end of it, that's going to be a tremendous amount of commercial space that will be vacant. And we know this is coming because banks are selling their properties and leasing them back. That's the exit strategy. So they're not holding on to brick and mortar. And then also the real estate industry, the brokerages, the little real estate brokers that we see throughout the city and throughout the boroughs, their model is now going internet-based. There's no need for a local brokerage. Online, using a smartphone, you can find an apartment, an investment property, or a home. Most of the homeowners are listing to save on the commissions directly. Um, this is going to have a tremendous impact. And we're not there. We're being re reactive instead of proactive. And even when we're reactive, we're not fully delivering on the needs of these small businesses. We talk a good game, we underdeliver, and we continue to create a burden on our small businesses. Folks, when, that, when our small businesses leave the city, when I say leave, they close permanently because they can't survive. That tax base is going to be a huge tax burden on the rest of the residents of New York City. And there's only one other place that we can get that tax revenue. Additional real estate tax increases, which will be placed on homeowners, making New York City less affordable. And I'm tying this in as a chain, and I don't have a magic bull, I wish I did, but the writing is on the wall. And either we start getting aggressive and come up with out-of-the-box thinking before we head down that irreversible path. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that statement, but no, I, I would just say that you know, um, as as the environment changes, we are looking at ways uh, to make uh, smart investments. Um, if you look at our our uh, commercial district needs assessments, uh, that is one of the ways we're looking at commercial corridors. Uh, we're trying to become smarter by getting data that actually uh, can help us um, uh, inform. Uh, new services that we may or uh, that we may need to deploy. Uh, we need to understand uh, better. Uh, for example, you listed two two sectors: uh, the banking sector and the real estate, uh, the brokerage uh, sector. Um, but we need to understand in different corridors uh, what is the reason why properties are vacant, um, and uh, figure out if there's if there's something that we as an agency can do uh, to help uh, those particular. Uh, uh, commercial quarters uh, attract better retail. Uh, you know, one of the things our studies do, we do is we understand what the community needs. Uh, so if the community needs, for example, restaurants where they can sit down instead of just takeout restaurants, then that is now a, 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 a strategy in terms of um, how we can help a local organization uh, attract those particular types of businesses to that commercial corridor. Uh, so if there's an increase in vacancies because a sector is collapsing, I think we are well poised um, uh, to actually understand what we can do uh, to attract uh, different types of uh, businesses uh, to that vacant space. And we've talked about vacancy um, as an issue and, and getting better data. Um, and I believe we're going to have a conversation about this on, on Monday uh, with a set of bills that we're going to be uh, discussing. Commissioner, the, to the point, you know, first we want to try to keep those commercial stores there, right? Those mom and pop businesses, before we start looking what can replace them, we need to find out what we can do to make sure their doors stay open. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and, and I was just referring to the, the, the your mm -hmm. comment about uh, increasing vacancies because the banking industry is going to move out of brick and mortar. Uh, but my goal has always been, and the agency's goal has always been, uh, to help businesses not only start, but expand and operate. Uh, right. We want businesses to be successful in New York City. It, it pains me when businesses close because that is not just a business that's closed. That's someone's that's dream. True. That's someone's, you know, life savings that uh, is now, you know, it's gone. Um, and we are trying to do everything possible to figure that out. When we talk to business owners, yes, um, it, I agree with you, rent is not the only issue, uh, but we do hear about rent. Uh, we hear about uh, the cost of running that business, and that could be any number of things, which is why we focus on trying to reduce the regulatory burden on businesses, uh, try to uh, in, in, enhance the transparency so businesses can be in compliance. Uh, you know, we are looking at and be happy to continue talking to you about other areas. Uh, there's, you know, serious cost in healthcare, for example, um, uh, to actually, if you have a business with employees, um, there's issues um, with your back office, uh, understanding uh, your expenses and um, your income and figure out ways where you can make smart investments. Uh, this is why we are innovating uh, with programs like Love Your Local, uh, where we're making an investment, and a huge investment, uh, to help long-standing businesses. And based on the data that we're going to get back from that program, that will help us inf uh, uh, inform whether or not, for example, uh, the workshops that we offer is the right type of workshops, and we can actually adjust there. So I don't think we're, we're under-delivering. I think we are, are trying to innovate. Uh, in, in a changing marketplace um, because we know that technology has totally changed the game for small businesses. Commissioner, I couldn't agree with you more, but we certainly can do more. And I want to just touch back on SB1. Four years in the works, roughly $36 million and 80 rules have been modified. And even if we use the number 5,300 that comes from SBS, 80 modified, which probably means they were made worse, not better. But I, let's not go back to that because it's a never-ending conversation. And on top of that, as commissioner of SBS, when you hear real estate taxes, which are already high and impacting many small businesses, are projected to rise by $1.8 billion alone in this budget on top of the $1.5 billion in the last budget. Isn't that concerning? Do you, at that point, express your concerns of, to our partners, the, the rest of the government, um, so, as to what are we actually doing here? So I would say that um, uh, you're, you're making a correlation that when taxes increase, real estate taxes increase, it immediately goes through to the small business. It, does. It, all, it all depends on the lease that the small business has. I come from that world. I know. So, so then you know that in some cases, if you're a savvy enough small business and you have an attorney, uh, you can negotiate whether or not uh, you get a triple net lease or the landlord is actually responsible for the property tax and you just have a fixed amount. Uh, that is why we made investments on ensuring that small businesses have access to attorneys to actually negotiate their leases. Uh, that is, I mean, we are looking at ways where we can prevent that from happening in terms of, um, you know, making sure that our small businesses are equipped with the same tools that the larger businesses have and the chains have. Uh, because our mom and pops, and uh, in my testimony I mentioned, uh, that almost 80% of the individuals that have used our, our commercial lease assistance uh, are not only small businesses, um, uh, but they're minority businesses, they're immigrant-owned, and they're women. Um, so we want to make sure that we continue these investments and we will continue the program uh, and get the small businesses the help that they need at the very beginning so they're better prepared. Uh, we have businesses that have used our commercial lease assistance program uh, that have been savvy enough to now ne have negotiated with the help of an attorney, for example, a 10-year lease, um, which, as you know, if you have a 10-year lease, you have the stability and you're able to plan out your business much better than if you have a five-year lease. Um, so, yes, we want to make sure that we provide all the tools Commissioner, necessary. the facts that I know at 50 percent of businesses never make it to year five. Year 10 uh, is something that 
they would strive for. Whether the landlord in the lease does it pass on to the tenant directly or waits till the lease is renewed so the, the real estate tax increases will be passed onto those tenants in one form or another. It's simple. City charges landlord, landlord will charge a tenant. Tenant pays the landlord, landlord will pay the city. The real culprit is the city in this regard. <coughs> Landlords are going to recoup the increases in real estate taxes either with that tenant or the next tenant or on an annual basis as those increases come in. And I just want to reiterate that we owe it to those small businesses to be a voice for them that when budget negotiations are going on and revenue is being discussed, to say they can't afford it. They cannot, this cannot be sustainable. These are real dollars that are impacting our small businesses and they just can't do it. Compete, give to their employees and give in the, in the form of taxation. That's where, and I'm glad that you opened up the next segue into MWBEs because these small businesses are minority and women-owned businesses, the same group that we're trying to protect, the same group that we're trying to get creative so that they can be, today's employees become tomorrow's employers, and once they become employers, that there's a sustainable path for them to have their business models continue. Mm -hmm. um, we. We're nowhere near the goal of 30%. Am I correct that we uh, aggressively set for our WMBE businesses? Our certifications are up, that's great. And probably in par with projections or above projections from last year, but they're still not getting to work. They're still not reaping the benefits of their certification. So I, I, I would disagree with the the, the the, I mean, so we are um, on, the mayor set a goal of 30% um, by I believe 2021. Um, so since the start of this administration, um, you know, we started at a number of like 3%. Um, last fiscal year, we were about 20%. So clearly we were making progress and really good progress. Uh, we've, inc we've increased the amount of discretion uh, that agencies have, and we've seen a tremendous amount of increase um, in new businesses, in new contracts, uh, in contracts to new MWBEs. Uh, I will not ever say that we are and have uh, been, um, you know, uh, you know, we, we have more work to do. Um, we know this. Um, you know, we have more to do in terms of getting more um, black and Hispanic firms uh, into the pool. Um, and when they get into the pool, get, uh, have them uh, compete. We've made investments at SBS uh, because uh, the Deputy Mayor, um, Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson have said uh, it's, it's not good enough to just get them certified, and we agree, uh, but we also need to help them build the capacity to win contracts. So we've made investments in technical assistance. Uh, so if businesses have never bid on a contract, uh, we have that service, um, and we have seen the results. The, 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 uh, companies that use our services of the of the MWBs that have won contracts, uh, over two thirds of those companies uh, utilized an SBS service. Uh, so we know that if a MWB uses our services, they're uh, in a better position uh, to actually win. Uh, so uh, we continue to do as much as possible. Uh, we talked about our uh, the our uh, con uh, contract financing program. Uh, which opened up about $50 million of opportunities uh, for businesses uh, that used um, our contract financing. Um, and we continue working with the MW community uh, to identify other barriers. Uh, there's barriers in insurance. Um, you know, in insurance is a big uh, uh, a barrier for especially MWBs in construction um, and acquiring low-cost insurance. Um, uh, we are working closely with the Office of MWB to address other areas uh, on the legislative side to ensure that we continue the progress that we've made. Thank you. Can you update us on the disparity study? Uh, the disparity study is complete. 
which is why in the budget you see the, the decrease. Uh, we are right now in the process um, on the legislative side in terms of implementing the, uh, the new numbers in the disparity study into local law one. We haven't seen the findings thus far. They haven't been made available. The findings published. Yeah, yeah the, the findings have been published. Um, we can send you a copy. Uh, or you can go on our, well, we'll send you a copy. That would be great. Yep. Um, have you m had a time to digest the findings and implement an approach as to how we're going to increase the MWBE, not only certification, but uh, meet their needs to continue to strive for that 30% bar? Yeah. Yes. So, so I would say that the, you know, the findings found disparity across all uh, uh, groups. Uh, part of what we're doing um, to address uh, those disparity, uh, where the city has discretion, uh, the city actually performs really well. And what that means is where agency has a lot of flexibility, they can do that. Uh, we see that in the different purchasing areas uh, with our micro purchases uh, where the city actually exceeds 30% utilization. Um, there are areas, for example, in uh, prime contracting where the city has to be competitive, where we are working uh, with our partners of the Office of MWBE uh, to change uh, some state uh, regulations to, to help us, for example, uh, build uh, mentorship programs. Uh, similar to, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the MTA or the uh, School Construction Authority, they have men mentorship programs that uh, a lot of MWBs have been successful in. Uh, we, the city, are not allowed to do uh, programs uh, uh, in exactly that way, so we are working with um, you know, our partners on the state level uh, to give us the flexibility to actually build out mentorship programs. Uh, so that way someone can go to not only graduate from our mentorship classes, which we focus on the back office, but then go immediately into um, work, uh, which is how the MTA and the SCA is structured. Right now, if someone graduates, they still have to bid on that, on that, on that particular work um, uh, at the different agencies. But where we have discretion, uh, we are doing really well. Um, this particular budget doesn't break down, uh, the preliminary budget doesn't break down the MBWE uh, allocations, the dollar amount. We're not even sure if they're going to be uh, restored. It doesn't reflect in here if they're going to be subject to cuts um, or if there's going to be increase in that budget to make sure that we offer these services. So so the, the only change was the disparity study. The mayor, the mayor has been clear that the MW program is a priority. Uh, we do not expect, um, anticipate any change in services. Uh, as a matter of fact, again, as I said, we're, we're pushing uh, to in, in, in ensure that we have um, more flexibility on the, discretion, on the discretion side. So when, in the budget, it doesn't define the bond surety and the loan program so that so the, MWBEs? the right. So the the bond fund is um, so we have two funds. Um, one is the contract financing fund, which again I said we you know we've been able to connect businesses to about nine million dollars. Uh, the bond the bond surety fund is a program where if you are a construction company that have won a contract uh, and you are looking to get a bond, as you know, getting a bond you need to put up a certain amount of cash uh, reserves. Uh, that fund is available uh, for MWBE. Uh, our utilization in that program has um, uh, been low, uh, particularly because you know some MWBEs actually may not need it, or um, uh, you know the, the the specific MWBEs may not have won that particular contract. Uh, so some of the the decrease that you've seen is our adjustment based on the utilization of that program. And. Is there anything else that you can update on the MWBE aspect of this preliminary budget where you would like to see some emphasis and additional support and not from the council, please? We do more than our fair share. I, th I think, you know, again, we are focused on increasing um, our ability to, um, in terms of discretion across the city, uh, city agencies. 
Um, you know, we are focused a lot on uh, particular targets for exactly, for, for example, um, you know, black women-owned companies. Uh, we are, are, are being very strategic in terms of how we get more black women-owned companies certified. Uh, so we're working with different groups, et cetera. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, what we're doing uh, for Hispanic-owned companies. Um, so again, we are, are looking to make sure that we certify the right number of companies. Um, where we are working and, you know, with your help, and when I say your help, not necessarily a, a law of a council, but working with our state partners is really uh, where we have seen success is where the city has discretion. Uh, so our discretionary level right now is 150000 So any agency that's looking uh, to make a purchase, they can bid out to three MWBEs. Um, but we may be interested in actually raising that level because the state, uh, other state agencies are over 200000 uh, and the MTA is about 400000 um, So that is definitely something that, that we're looking at. I have a suggestion. What if we add to the MWBEs the ability to certify realtors that will help identify real estate in the city that they're looking to acquire, lease, rent? That may go a long way because I don't think real estate realtor, realtors are certified as WMBEs and they're not offered in the procurement process, uh, the opportunity uh, to participate in the 30% threshold I, that we've set. Uh, I, so for, for sure I know we have real, uh, real estate companies that are certified. Um, I think the, the, um, the opportunities, because I, you know, we, we spend anywhere between 15 and $18 billion in services. Uh, so the specific opportunities, whether it's through DCAS or um, through any of the other agencies that deal uh, with real estate assets. I, I don't have like the concrete number of what that opportunity looks like, um, but certainly there, when we certify firms, one of the things we do is uh, we have a team uh, that will do an analysis of not only their profile to make sure that their codes are correct, uh, but then we also look at where we see the, their particular opportunities uh, in, in, in other agencies and make that connection uh, to help them with their business development. Uh, so we can certify the real estate companies. I, I just don't know uh, the number of, for example, contracts uh, that real estate companies won um, in last fiscal year, but we can certainly give that to you. And if there is, uh, if you would like for us to do a specific outreach to real estate companies, we'd be more than happy to work with you on that. That's one of those segments that I mentioned that I'm fearful of the future and the amount of square footage that they currently occupy. And the only way I can see uh, helping them, especially the minority and women owned businesses that many of these real estate brokers are, this may be a good way for us to get into a, se to open up that segue. Gotcha. Uh, there's plenty of leasing that's done in New York City by New York City. Uh, and I'd love to see the findings of that report if they actually exist. And you're of the disparity it, study? No, meaning uh, in particular to the real estate end of it. The oh, we can we can do it. Uh, they may be certified, but I have yet to meet a single realtor that has been certified that said we have uh, been able to procure leasing and sales because of our certification for New York City. I will introduce you to a few. Thank you. Um, career pathways, slated to be cut. Uh, so the career pathways is not in the preliminary budget, but we are, uh, we have ongoing conversations with uh, OMB uh, about continuing those services. Um, again, uh, this is part of a larger conversation about workforce funding. Uh, so uh, that is why it's, you don't see it in the preliminary, but we are still talking to OMB. I just want to note that uh, Council Member Levin has joined us, and I'm sure he'll ask a question when he's ready. Um, because it's not listed, it also brings me to the program areas and headcount changes and uh, 45 uh, headcounts that are slated impact not only career pathway reporting with 13 cuts and community development block grant disaster recovery with seven cuts, agency vacancy reduction initiative, seven, Center for Economic Opportunity Initiatives, five, 
support for small businesses, love your local, which you were just referring to, slated for four. And the Mayor's Office of Preservation and Development, one, mm -hmm. as well as Discretion Management initi Initiative, eight. No, that's a plus eight. You're okay there. Isn't that funny? The Mayor's Office. It's, it's actually the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities. Okay. And Discretionary Management Initiative. Tell me about Discretionary Management Initiative. Why are we increasing the headcount by eight when we're cutting all the others? Those are the resources necessary to manage the, the discretionary contracts. I'm sorry? Council discretionary contracts. Those are the resources necessary to manage the council discretionary contracts. So the more we put in, the higher the headcount? The less we put in, the lower the headcount? It's a lot of work to manage the jillions of contracts. You know, I, I believe the dollar amount that the council added into the SBS budget last year was $23 million. Am I correct on that, uh, Commissioner? For council discretionary? Mm-hmm. Uh, it sounds 24.3. Yeah. Of the limited resources that we have, that's a good percentage of our budget compared to the mayor's budget. Um, I'm hopeful that we're not going to play the game of cut so we can restore uh, on the council's end of it when we don't have much available to restore. Um, and I hope that you'll be a solid voice uh, for restoring the services that we know, the existing initiatives that we have, as well as any new programs that may be coming on a pipeline, because we love to fund new initiatives and forget about old ones, and that falls on the council then to fill in the gap for the two. Um, I'm really hopeful that you'll continue to be a strong advocate for those programs that we know work. Uh, Absolutely. And these projected headcount changes are not an indication that's going to happen. This is the preliminary budget. Uh, so again, uh, we're having ongoing conversations. So for example, um, I discussed about construction safety. Um, you know, when you look at um, last year, this, this reduction is based on the fact that we are now a year into designing the program. We have a better understanding of the resources that we need. Um, career pathways, again, we're ongoing conversations with, uh, with OMB. Um, and um, you know, in areas, um, for example, love your local, um, you know, we are work, again, ongoing conversations. Uh, so it is my goal, to, to your point, uh, to ensure that we focus on the programs that work and uh, we ensure uh, that we have all the tools necessary to help our uh, small businesses succeed. Councilmember Levin, I believe, has a question. Thank you very much, Chair John I. Um, hi, Commissioner, how are you? How are you doing? Good. Um, I uh, wanted to ask a little bit about, I don't know if uh, the chair asked about this, but Workforce One centers and um, how, I, I chair the General Welfare Committee uh, which oversees HRA um, uh, and public assistance and obviously from the 1996 uh, welfare reform legislation, <clears throat> there are work requirements often for people receiving public assistance how, uh, how does SBS play a role? How do the Workforce uh, One mm -hmm. centers play a role in all of this? And, um, and, and what are some new initiatives that you're doing there? So I, I'll start and then uh, Jackie can uh, jump <coughs> in. Uh, you know, we work, we work closely with um, uh, HRA. Uh, one of the things that we piloted, uh, for example, up in the Washington Heights Center uh, was uh, being able to connect our, our, our participants uh, to HRA services if necessary. Uh, we first started with a co-location uh, uh, type of um, uh, programming, um, and then HRA trained our staff, uh, so sort of like a trainer trainer, uh, to actually uh, connect to those uh, particular um, uh, resources. Um, you know, we have, uh, we, we are, uh, our model is we work closely with the small businesses. Small businesses tell us, tells us the skill sets that they're looking for. Uh, we've hosted uh, and we've worked with HRA on, um, on recruiting events. 
Uh, so we gave HRA sort of the skills uh, that they're, that the small business was looking for, and we helped make those connections. Uh, and we continue work looking uh, at different ways we can work um, with uh, HRA. I would just probably add that um, to the second part of your question, we are and have been trying to um, invest more and more in occupational skills trainings that will, will open up opportunity for all New Yorkers to, to um, combat inequity. And HRA is a, a key partner. They, they are a, a key referral source. And, and through the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, we're um, planning on even more uh, integration and, and coordination as we move forward. Is there a role for SBS after uh, people are placed in jobs uh, or have connected with employers, small businesses, to um, you know, continue to uh, support them as they're in the workforce? Um, one of the programs that we that we run that uh, I, I think is in in line with what you're saying is it, is it um, advancement training for existing workers through our custom it's called customized training. Okay. It provides businesses with up to four hundred thousand dollars to train their existing staff so they can take on uh, greater uh, transferable skills. Okay. So we think that's a okay. Um, The work that, again, if the chair had asked this, I apologize, but the work that uh, SBS does with CUNY on the, um, the mayor's uh, commitment to double the number of, of jobs for CUNY graduates, or double the number of CUNY graduates with computer science degrees. Yep. Um, what role has SBS played in that? And um, mm -hmm. you know, can you provide maybe an update? Obviously, this would be a partnership with CUNY, but, um, but I would be, I'd be interested to know how we're Achieving that, and then, and then, what we're really what we're doing for for um, uh, CUNY grads as they're coming out of um, of school with uh, with undergraduate degrees, um, you know, how are, how is the city connecting them with the employment sector? So, I th you know, so one of the things, um, so I, early in my testimony, I talked about the industry partnerships, uh, and technology is one of the sectors that we're investing in as a city. Uh, our role um, is you, we have uh, in the industry partnerships uh, uh, tech talent pipeline, um, and we bought together. And what we do is we bring the industry, so the tech companies, uh, together to understand the needs of those companies, the skill sets that they need. Uh, and then we work with not only academic institutions, but other uh, community-based organizations that are in that space, that training space, uh, to ensure that we are developing and we are producing a workforce that the industry needs. Uh, so our role in, uh, in CUNY 2X was uh, the understanding in, uh, in, uh, that uh, the most diverse workforce is actually in CUNY. Um, and our tech companies, uh, we really needed to make sure that we connected uh, CUNY to our tech companies. Uh, one of the things, um, though, that the tech company said is that uh, CUNY students were at a disadvantage. One, because uh, the information that they were learning were date was dated. Um, you know, there's new types of ways to do development um, that CUNY students were not being taught. Uh, they did not have the um, ability to actually do internships uh, at, in, uh, to show that they could work in sort of like in modern uh, type of um, uh, tech companies. Uh, so uh, our CUNY 2X initiative is actually funding uh, the different resources that CUNY needed uh, to actually enhance their ability uh, to produce a workforce that's in line with what the industry needed. So for example, uh, our tech and residency program uh, we have employees uh, from tech companies who have volunteered their time uh, to actually um, uh, teach at CUNY schools, uh, and the CUNY and the funding also goes to uh, helping CUNY schools get the resources that they need, whether it's a, whatever it's equipment, et cetera, uh, to ensure that those students have um, the the not only the the space and the equipment, but the um, the the the, the uh, instructor. Uh, to teach them the things that they need uh, today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. I do want to talk about bids and the important role that they play, uh, Commissioner, and I know that you're fond of them as well. Um, 
and they truly are the front line to preserving our commercial corridors. Um, I am concerned that, unfortunately, most of their budget goes to city services such as sanitation and security instead of the intended purpose, which is to help market and promote the growth and sustainability of our commercial corridors. This is something that I hope we can continue to work on. Um, our bids should be equipped with marketing the corridors that uh, they encumber um, and less of a burden on services that the city should be providing, um, up to half of their budgets. And in some cases, as much as 70% of their budgets are going to city services, sanitation, and security. We need them to focus more on marketing and bringing foot traffic to those corridors. And I hope that's something we'll continue to focus on. Um, so I, I just, only because we were on the record, uh, the bids are not, so the services they provide are supplemental. Um, so uh, if a bid is um, when they are shaping their budget, um, you know, they're basing their budget based on what the board of that bid wants that bid to prioritize. Um, so yes, in certain areas, uh, the board may say, we want you to focus a lot on sanitation service. It does not preclude the city has to do its job in terms of actually providing sanitation security. Uh, the work that the bids are doing is just providing supplementary uh, services. Uh, so again, if, um, because all the, the 76 bids, uh, they all have their own uh, independent boards that we sit on, um, and the council member in that district uh, would have a representation, if there's an issue with the spend and the budget allocation, uh, that is definitely something that the board uh, of that bid uh, would should address. Thank you for clarifying that. But when the trash cans on the corner are overflowing because there isn't enough city services by the Department of Sanitation and picking up the trash cans frequently, that garbage is spewing onto the streets, which requires the bids to be aggressive, not only of making sure that they don't overfill, but they clean up the whatever right. debris is being right. thrown around. Right. And as far as security goes, although we don't expect a NYPD detail for every one of our bids, the reason why they hire additional security is because of the lack of NYPD enforcement um, on these commercial corridors, both city services, sanitation and policing. And what they're, what they're doing, because there's a lack of services, they're supplementing those services. And what they're double dipping, and the city gets to benefit this, by this, because they're already paying real estate taxes and income tax and sales tax collections to make sure those services are adequate for these commercial corridors, and then they get this bid assessment placed on your real estate taxes where, again, they're being paying into subsidizing city services. That's the point I'm making, that if we had adequate sanitation and we had adequate policing, those bids can focus more of their budget on marketing those commercial corridors and bring in additional foot traffic. And that would make their businesses more sustainable. So I, uh, the last thing I would say is that if you are aware of a bid that has uh, exceeded their budget with sanitation and security services because of a lack of city resources, I'd be happy to talk to you about that and figure out ways uh, I could talk to my counterparts uh, to make sure that we address that because bids are supposed to provide supplementary services, uh, not in lieu of uh, city services. Thank you, Commissioner. So let me wrap up with, um, I hope to hear back from you on the projected OMB cuts. Um, ahead of the cuts being finalized as we move forward, 
I hope I'm going to get the survey from you before the results come in. The disparity study, as well as the uh, an update as to why your website doesn't include all of the positions or the uh, head counts that we were referring to, 70 or 90 or 101, whatever it may be, and uh, we'll get an update on that. And I don't know if there's anything else that we discussed. Oh, a list of the community groups. I thought I forgot this one. Last year's preliminary budget hearing, um, with then the commissioner uh, of neighborhood development stated that you'd forward us a list of the 150 to 160 organizations and close to the 1,000 to 1,500 different organizations or representatives. That was promised last year's preliminary budget. We never got that list. Um, can I get an assurance from you that this information will get to us somewhere, somehow, so we can do our outreach as well and kind of partner up on meeting their needs and hearing from them and uh, becoming more proactive if they're still in business, that is. So um, I just want to be clear, um, and I'm, I'm, again, we are, we pride ourselves to be very responsive as an agency, so I'm not sure. The 170 organizations, because we work with a number of organizations, um, uh, you're specifically focused on organizations that we work with through neighborhood development or? Neighbor development, chambers, bids, uh, merchants associations, trade associations, whatever. So any business, any organizations that we work with to connect That's with true. small businesses, you would like to know who they are? I, I was given the number of 150 to 160. And then the quote that I, my records reflect from last year's testimony is that you have anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 different organizations or representatives that you work with or are in touch with, and I'm sure uh, through your email blasts or other communications. This would also help us continue to build on the responsibilities that we both right. have. So I can, um, so what we can get to is the organizations that we work with. Uh, I think any, any uh, um, uh, individuals who work with us, that information is um, uh, confidential to us. Um, but we can certainly work with you to uh, let you know what organizations we work with on neighborhood development, um, uh, because the bids are part of that as well, um, and um, our, our LDCs um, and any of the other organizations that we work with, especially the ones we do work with to get the word out about our services. Uh, so we'll, we'll, I will make sure that you get that information. I want to thank you again for your testimony, your patience, and your continued cooperation. And once again, thank your staff. I'm very fond of them and uh, the cooperation that I get from them as well. You're very fortunate to have them. Uh, I and feel very fortunate. before you poach any of my staff, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hands off. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with you. We'd like to call up the first panel, uh, Julian Hill, Adriana Mendoza, Mary, is it Batista? Yeah. Batista, I hope, or Busta, and Saduf Segal.
Good afternoon. I just want to thank you for your patience, and I hope uh, you found the testimony uh, informative, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to start yeah. with the far right, and we'll move in a row. Great. Ladies first. Is that okay, sir? Excellent. Thank Please you. introduce yourself, your name, and if you're with an organization. Sure. My name is Sadaf Sial, and I am uh, the coordinating director at the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives. Thank you, Chairperson Jonai, and members of the City Council Committee on Small Business for allowing me to testify. I'm, uh, I'm here with uh, the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, which is the local trade association representing worker cooperative businesses across New York City in all the five boroughs and in various industries. I'm also here on behalf of 14 nonprofit organizations that comprise the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative. And these organizations for the past five years have been working to create, sustain, and grow worker cooperatives uh, across the city. And I should mention that we do this in partnership with SPS, that is our contracting agency. So we've worked with them over time. Um, but to just, I wanna say that the worker cooperative businesses that exist in this city are overwhelmingly owned and controlled by people of color, by women of color, and by immigrants. And through the support of this initiative, we've been able to create a comprehensive ecosystem that responds to their needs effectively. We are able to create businesses, uh, including startups, as well as business conversions. So traditional businesses that transition into worker ownership when, say, a business owner is retiring. Um, we have been able to also provide a lot of technical assistance that allows these worker cooperative businesses to grow and be sustainable over time, and that includes legal supports, um, financial supports, and business planning supports. And finally, we do a lot of education and outreach as there's been growing interest um, and demand to learn about worker cooperatives across different communities in the city. We do want to urge the City Council to continue to support worker co-ops and WCBDI with an enhancement of 4 point, to 4.85 for fiscal year 2020. Repeat that number again. Four, you want to four. increase to 4.85? That is correct. Um, and I want to say that when, this, when City Council decided to fund worker cooperative development five years ago, it was the first city in the country to do so and has since, since inspired a variety of other country, uh, cities around the country to do the same, from Madison, Wisconsin to Berkeley, California, just recently. Um, also on a national level, we've seen the passage of an uh, act that recognizes worker cooperatives, the Main Street Employee Ownership Act. So we're seeing a growing interest both nationally and a growing interest locally. And we want to be able to meet that demand and we hope that New York City continues to play a leading role in supporting worker co-ops. Um, I will stop there and allow for others to speak more because beyond WCBDI, I think that there are other things that the city can be doing as well. You're absolutely right, and thank you for that, and I'm a big supporter of cooperatives. I truly believe in the bulk purchase discounts that they can get together, and by pooling their resources, we all benefit, so thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Adriana Mendoza. I'm a worker owner at Census Scholars Tutoring Cooperative in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, so thank you, um, Chairperson Jornai and um, the New York City Council Committee on Small Businesses. Um, so again, I'm here on behalf of my cooperative, um, Sunset Scholars. We provide tutoring services in uh, English as a second language and also students, young people, students up to middle school in the community and across the city. Um, I first heard about worker cooperatives through my mother, who is a founding uh, worker owner of Beyond Care, which is a child care cooperative that provides um, quality child care services across the city. And they've successfully grown to about 40 members now. Um, and I also learned about worker cooperatives through uh, the Center for Family Life. Um, and uh, I've learned about the cooperative business model, its values, its principles, and um, how they put people and worker owners first. Um, while offering, offering an opportunity to collectively create businesses um, and also have a say in their workplace. Um, I am a second generation cooperator. I um, have worked with Sunset Scholars and to grow the cooperatives since 2015 when we were founded. Um, 
And we have worked to increase worker awareness of worker cooperatives in Sunset Park. Um, We're currently 10 uh, members, 10 worker owners in the cooperative, and we have all grown tremendously per, uh, per personally, professionally, and um, we've all participated in leadership roles, um, and we have all gained business, valuable business skills, uh, while also providing quality tutoring and having significant work for all of us. Um, the Center for Family Life incubated our cooperative and assisted us with training, um, informing the cooperative business, and also provided ongoing support for the past few years. Um, today, we're fully independent, and we have come together with other uh, worker cooperatives to share a space and to create a local network in Sunset Park, Alianza CUS, Cooperatives United for Sunset Park. Um, and it was thanks to CUS that we, are, we were able to become independent and, and create uh, a shared office space, uh, an office manager. Um, and I believe cooperative business models are very important in the community, especially for immigrants. Uh, Sunset Scholars is mainly uh, made up of young people, um, so it's also a great opportunity for youth um, to create work for themselves while also providing uh, education opportunities for the younger folks. Um, and also as a new mother, I look forward to providing, um, to, to sharing the opportunities that I now have to share um, information about the cooperatives, cooperation, and being a business owner with my young daughter. Um, and I really look forward uh, to the city continuing its important support for worker cooperatives. Um, and also, we hope that the city considers contracting us and other worker cooperatives for services and products. Thank you so much for that. Hi. Um, good afternoon, Chair Peterson and Jonai, and the distinguished members of the New York City Council Committee on Small Business. My name is Maro Bautista, and I am the Director of Cooperative Development at the Center for Family Life. Center for Family Life is a 40-year-old social service organization based in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and has been part of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative since its inception in 2014. We are deeply grateful for the support of our city council um, that has given us and worker cooperative development in the city. Um, we're fighting economic inequality um, for New Yorkers. Center for Family Life has been providing tailored and long-term cooperative development services to more than 20 worker cooperatives for the past 12 years. We have successfully developed a model that supports low-income New Yorkers in starting and growing worker cooperative businesses. The vast majority of those we work with are struggling to make ends meet, often with one, two, or more low-wage jobs, typically in the domestic work sector, such as cleaning, daycare, elder care, pet care, and pet care. Many do not speak English, or do not speak English as a first language, and have limited levels of formal education. Worker owners in cooperative businesses supported by CFL have been primarily first-generation immigrant. 76% of them are Spanish-speaking, 83% of them are women, 73% have high school education or less, and 72% of them have children. Small business ownership has provided them with a path to their family's economic stability and provided them with the tools and supports to become even more active participants in their communities. The Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative is not only helping, us, helping start worker cooperatives, but it's also at the forefront of business model innovation with the goal of bringing worker ownership to scale. For example, conversions, like Sada was mentioning, are a strategy that gives a pathway for, to retiring business owners to maintain their legacy while giving workers job security by helping them to purchase the business in which they've been investing their labor. Center for Family Life's cooperative franchise model is taking key scaling pieces of the franchise world, such as share branding and services and making them accessible to communities in most need by providing them with the toolkits, guides, and tailored supports. Through this new, new program, New Yorker, any New Yorker can have the opportunity to start their own, own worker-owned business and join us as a successful and recognizable brand. Um, can I continue? Okay. Through the Riley Co-op franchise, we want to transform the cleaning industry in the city. Up and Go, the first cooperative technology platform to be owned by worker cooperatives from communities of color, connects customers looking for residential or commercial cleaning with worker cooperatives in the city. Up and Go is giving worker cooperatives the ability to compete with other platforms that are not centered in workers' needs or their labor. These initiatives, among, among many others, are strengthening our small business community and the services provided by all of our partners are key to reaching the most vulnerable residents in our city. 
there is growing interest in worker cooperatives from city agencies, academic and financial institutions, also community-based organizations, and also New Yorkers themselves. We would like to see worker cooperative development as a fully integrated feature of what the most entrepreneurial city in the United States has to offer. We urge the City Council to increase the funding for this innovative initiative from $3.9 million in to $4.85 in next year and continue sending a strong message that New York City values and supports worker ownership and that is an essential part of the portfolio of the Department of Small Business Services. Thank you. It sounds like you have your own little cooperative going on there. You went from 4.8 to 4.85, huh? <laughs> it, it's it's 4.85. It's 4.85. I think I might have misspoke. <laughs> Chairman Jonai, members of the Committee on Small Business, um, thank you for this opportunity. Really excited to talk about the social, political, economic, and also moral benefits of worker cooperatives, both to their workers as well as to our community, as well as the critical nature of legal services and other technical assistance funded through the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, WCBDI, um, for creating a New York City that centers equity, increases belonging, and encourages democratically run enterprises. My name is Julian Hill, and I'm a staff attorney at the Community Development Project, or CDP, at the Urban Justice Center. Among the other things that we do, we strengthen the impact of grassroots organizations in New York City's low-income and other marginalized communities by providing legal support. We bring cases, publish, publish community-driven research reports, and provide technical assistance in support of racial, economic and social justice. For almost 15 years, CDP has collaborated with community organizations like those before you today to help low-income New York City residents form worker-owned cooperative businesses. I love my job, leaving a lucrative Wall Street law firm job to do it, um, and WCBDI makes it possible for me to be here today. I enjoy demystifying complicated legal concepts so that my brilliant, mostly black, mostly brown, mostly women, often immigrant, worker-owner clients can do what they do best. They trust us to ensure that their legal structure reflects their core values of cooperation. Woke Foods, a woman-owned Dominican and Afro-Caribbean food service cooperative, uh, mixes a consciousness both in food justice as well as social justice, sourcing their food from ethical farms and paying their employees well above the minimum wage. Jami Madre, another cooperative, is also women-owned that focuses on legal cannabis-based oils, um, oils and is really focused on empowering women, some of whom are sisters, cousins, daughters, and friends of folks who've been incarcerated in this and other cities' jails and prisons as a result of the war on drugs. Um, to be at the forefront of a burgeoning industry to make sure that the format that they use honors their labor and also finds a way to advocate for a space and a voice for those who are most marginalized. Um, CDP this year has taken on over 15 new worker cooperative clients just this year partnering with several incubators and developers, including the Center for Family Life, Green Worker Cooperatives, and the ICA Group. As the worker cooperative ecosystem continues to grow, so does the need for legal services and technical assistance for ongoing support to already existing worker cooperatives. Since starting at CDP last year, I've seen my own um, client base of just worker cooperatives increase, increase, to over four, uh, increase to over 20 clients, each with their own set of distinct matters. As one of primarily two organizations providing free legal services to worker cooperatives and understanding as a former uh, big law associate that private law firm attorneys are billed out at hundreds of dollars an hour, we understand how expensive and hard it can be to find other options for legal services that are able to provide such niche worker cooperative expertise. Thank you for your time. I want to thank you all for your time and kudos to you. You got additional points. You each pronounced my name correctly. That was remarkable. Um, I am a supporter of cooperatives, and I'm looking forward to being an advocate to increase that budget. I truly believe in the model, and I know it works. You know it works, and um, the rest of the nation will follow suit. Thank you. Calling up the next panel, Eric Kim, Yolanda Gonzal Gonzaga, Katie Parks, Armando. Okay. Armando knows it. You know who you are, Armando. Great. And Kenrick Ross.
we may need to pull up one more chair there. Um, We're going to get you a chair. So maybe we'll start with you, and it's always women first, and we'll work our way down if it's okay. Did you, miss, did you submit your testimony in writing? Buenas, buenas tardes, honorable concejal Mark Jonay y distinguidos miembros del Comité de Pequeños Negocios de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Yolanda Gonzaga, soy de México, soy miembro del Proyecto de Justicia Laboral y me gustaría contarles un poco de mi historia. Primero quiero agradecerles la oportunidad de testificar hoy. Yo llegué aquí en este país en el año 1990. Yo llegué sin conocer nada y sin saber nada. Mi tía me metió a trabajar en, en casa. Trabajé interna por ocho años y me salí porque me di cuenta de los abusos de mi patrona. Me causaron muchos traumas por todos los malos tratos sufridos. También trabajé en un almacén por dos años, pero también tuve que dejar ese trabajo por abuso del supervisor. Por estas situaciones de violencia, empecé a sentirme con miedo e insegura, con mi autoestima muy baja y depresión. En mi búsqueda de un trabajo digno para poder proveer un mejor futuro a mi hija, yo viví muchas necesidades y, y aguantando tantas humillaciones que ningún ser humano debe vivir en una ciudad con tanta riqueza y en una ciudad donde los inmigrantes somos los que hacemos los trabajos más difíciles y importantes pero muy mal pagados. Pero en mi lucha por por buscar un trabajo digno en, en donde me respeten y me, y me valoren. Encontré el, el proyecto de justicia laboral, el cual con orgullo digo que mi centro, porque soy miembro líder del proyecto de justicia laboral, mi centro es como mi segundo hogar porque paso más allá allá en mi propia casa, pero sobre todo porque en, en donde he encontrado respaldo que necesito para sacar a mi familia adelante. El proyecto de justicia laboral me ha ayudado a empoderar, ayudándome a encontrar mi voz, a, a recuperar mi fuerza y recuperar mi, mi auto mi autoestima por los distintos entrenamientos que me ha brindado. El proyecto de justicia laboral como los entrenamientos de liderazgo, OSHA, 500, andamios, banderas y mucho más. He logrado ser dueña y trabajadora de mi pro propia cooperativa de entrenadores de OSHA que se llama United and Trainer Workers y, y ser la mejor modelo de madre para mi hija. Hoy más que nunca podemos, de, de nuestro centro, para seguir luchando, aprendiendo y contribuyendo a la economía de esta ciudad. 
Estoy aquí para pedir que en este nuevo año fiscal apoye a los centros de jornaleros con 3.6 millones para que mi centro o otros centros puedan seguir existiendo y respaldando a mi comunidad. En conclusión, gracias por la oportunidad de testificar. Esperamos que ustedes consideren los centros, los jornaleros y cooperativas como parte de sus prioridades durante el proceso de negocia negociación presupuestaria de este año y esperamos seguir trabajando estrechamente con ustedes. Gracias por otorgar el tiempo de, expre de expresarme y únase a nuestra lucha. Esperamos poder seguir contando con su apoyo para que podamos seguir cambiando la vida de la gente como ha cambiado la mía. Gracias. Yolanda, yes. thank you. Thank you for being here and for sharing your passionate story. Um, you're a voice to many um, people out there and I promise to commit not only to the day laborers and the cooperatives, but to changing the lives of immigrants. I am the son of immigrants and I fully understand what you have gone through uh, and I'm fully committed to you and all immigrants, but in particular, the most vulnerable of all, our day laborers. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. You don't need me to translate. Good afternoon. My name is Kenrick Ross, and I'm the program manager of the Commercial Lease Assistance Program. I thank Chairman Jonai and members of the committee and council for the opportunity to highlight our work on behalf of lower income small business owners and the critical need for this program to be renewed for the long term and expanded. Did you submit something in writing? Yes. It has Brooklyn Legal Services on top. Thank you. All right. Um, as Commissioner Bishop uh, mentioned, the CLA program is funded by a grant from the Department of Small Business Services to provide free legal services on lawn litigation matters to lower income small business owners across New York City. It is housed and managed by Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A, where I'm the small business support project manager. And it is done in partnership with VOLS, Volunteers of Legal Service, and the Community Development Project at Urban Justice Center. The CLA has had a tremendous impact for small business owners who are the least likely to have access to quality, affordable health um, legal services, and most vulnerable to displacement, gentrification, and harassment. Um, I know Commissioner Bishop uh, mentioned some statistics. We have a little bit more of an updated um, number, so I'll share those with you. As we enter the final quarter of the initial two-year 2.4 million grant, we have opened more than 400 cases all, almost all of them, 99% of them, are for small business owners who are considered lower income. More than three quarters are business owners of color, two thirds are immigrants, half are women, and a third do not speak English as their first language. While we prioritize the densest, most rapidly changing commercial areas, our clients are everywhere, including 46 um, commercial districts, um, 46 city council districts. I'm here to speak about two, hmm? Yes, um, I'm here to speak about two matters. One is the continuing stability of our program. We are advocating for this funding for the CLA to be baselined. We believe that in just one year, we're at 96% of our capacity. And if we are to continue, one, we have shown that there is an untapped need, and two, many of our cases take weeks, if not months, to resolve. Our small business owners need to know when they come to us that we will be there for the duration, not just for the end of a contract year. So at this point, what we have through SBS, and I, we understand budget constraints, is a one-year extension of the service. Uh, we, would like this, we would like the city council 
to baseline this funding so small business owners know that is available to them. The second point is what we've identified as additional needs beyond commercial leasing in terms of legal services. Many of our small businesses are not, form, um, are not formalized. Uh, a fifth of them do not have entities that protect them. So that is an area we're precluded from violations in addressing them, either preventing them through having small businesses understand their legal obligations or addressing them is a grave concern. As you yourself mentioned, this is not just crippling, it could be fatal to small business. And then um, finally, we, would also, we also know that small businesses have the same commercial leasing pressures that nonprofits, and sometimes nonprofits have it worse. And while we are a small business program, we would like to set aside a few of our cases for uh, nonprofit and nonprofit businesses and entities and cultural spaces. They approach us and unfortunately, we are not able to serve them. And I think that would be tremendous to the ecosystem of New York City for us to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Jonai, um, for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. My name is Armando moritz Chapelkin, and I am the Senior Economic Development Organizer at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. Submitted a written copy of my testimony, so I'm going to jump around a little bit in the interest of time. Uh, ANHD is committed to strengthening the needs of communities citywide and see small businesses as integral to the fabric of New York's neighborhoods. Unite for Small Business New York City, a coalition convened by ANHD, includes community organizations from across New York City fighting to protect New York small businesses and non-residential tenants from the threat of displacement with a particular focus on owner-operated, low-income, minority and immigrant-run businesses that serve low-income, immigrant and minority communities. ANHD commends the Department of Small Business Services as well as the CLA Consortium uh, for working to meet this crucial need, specifically through the CLA program. And I won't go into some of the language here about what CLA is, I think we've talked about it quite a bit. Um, but at a time when small business displacement threatens the very cultural fabric of what our communities actually look like, we encourage the council to continue to support this vitally important program as the trailblazing work being done in neighborhoods across the city will only serve to strengthen the position of commercial tenants and small businesses. And I know that there is a lot of legislation that's looking at, you know, considering expanding out even more services for commercial tenants and small businesses, and we look forward to having that conversation next week. Um, but just moving on, we also applaud SBS for their uh, Neighborhood Development Division, specifically the Avenue NYC grant program. I believe it was covered a little bit during the agency's testimony, but this is really a much needed resource to allocate funding to commercial corridors that are central to local neighborhoods, um, overall commercial vitality. And just to sum up in my last 20 seconds or so, we ask that the council continues to support the Industrial Business Service Provider Network, or the IBSPs. We applaud the administration's past decision to baseline 1.5 million for the IBSPs as part of the Industrial Action Plan, but that funding has run out through the end of this year. And so the program needs renewal, and at a time when we've seen tremendous strides on industrial land use policy as a result of partnership and engagement across the city, it is crucial that the city's broader industrial policy utilize the IBSPs as the local eyes and ears of industrial policy, and that we can keep this program operating. If you have any questions on these programs, I'd be happy to answer them, but thank you again for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda. Hello, working? Good afternoon. My name is Katie Parks, and I am here on behalf of the Business Outreach Center Network and our affiliate small business loan fund, Bach Capital Core CDFI. Bach Network provides business technical assistance, customized small business training, and access to capital in largely immigrant and minority communities throughout New York City. We serve two industrial business areas and operate the first business incubator in the Bronx. Bach Network is a member of the New York City Worker Cooperative Coalition, providing practical business development assistance to the growing number of cooperative businesses. Bach leads equity-driven initiatives and delivers affordable capital to minority and women-owned businesses. Bach Network is well known for its hands-on bilingual service model that supports entrepreneurs at every stage of business development and training for childcare and construction businesses and lending programs targeting minority and low-income entrepreneurs. Bach collaborates with New York City SBS to deliver industrial business services as the industrial business solutions provider for Queens Central and Brooklyn East. Our loan fund has grown both as a lending and training resource for certified minority and women-owned businesses with a special focus on construction contractors. 
Block Capital has loaned over $25 million to date. We delivered New York City's contract finance loan fund and have leveraged over $24 million in contracts for small businesses since March 2017, with close to $6 million in New York City contract financing loans. We see firsthand how community businesses of all sizes and types can benefit and grow, saving and creating jobs for New Yorkers. Our focus has grown to support New York businesses to access markets and financing while focusing on their own accountability to their workers. We promote quality jobs through small business development and cooperative business ownership. Every day, worker-owned cooperatives create jobs and equity for low-income New Yorkers in a variety of business sectors, from what is known as the caring economy to transportation, construction, and professional services. Community and immigrant-owned businesses are vital to local economies. These brave entrepreneurs are responsible for not only creating jobs, but for recirculating capital in their own neighborhoods. As a result, Bach Network is strongly supporting funding increases from City Council to support highly impactful business assistance programs and initiatives, including Chamber on the Go and Small Business Initiative. Bach Network urges the City Council to enhance support for business training, needs-based financial and business counseling, and access to capital for new entrepreneurs and local small businesses. The Bach Network and its members serving all five boroughs of New York City require request the City Council to increase its investment in the Chamber on the Go and Small Business Initiative overall. We are requesting to increase the allocation of Bach from 113,000 to 190,000, which will increase our inclusive business development services and will also leverage federal dollars. Bach Network urges the City Council to continue increasing its support of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative. Worker cooperatives are values-driven small businesses whose core purpose is to benefit workers in their community. Bach joins the Worker Cooperative Coalition to request the City Council to add resources that will enable expansion of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative to 4.85 million from 3.6 million. New York City Council has played a strategic role in supporting initiatives to save and create jobs, to encourage neighborhood business development, and to support strategies for equitable local economies and MWBE access to contracts. We look forward to our continued work together towards these shared goals. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you to the Committee on Small Business and Chair Jonai for the opportunity to testify. My name is Eric Kim, Small Business Project Manager at the Asian American Federation. We are here today to speak about the needs of Asian-owned small businesses. About half of net new economic activity in New York City and half of net new paid employment. Asian businesses are also an important source of jobs for new immigrants and provide an opportunity to learn skills specific to American workplaces. Since 2017, Asian American Federation has worked with over 100 small businesses located along Union Street Quarter in Flushing, Queens under an EDC grant. Asian, Asian American Federation requests funding to keep open our Flushing office to serve the Queens small business community and expand our program to other neighborhoods. With the grant ending in this summer, 2019, Asian American Federation seeks continue to funding to keep open the Flushing office to support small business owners, resolve their uh, merit issues, and potentially support businesses in other neighborhoods, such as Sunset Park. Our business support model includes marketing and neighborhood revitalization designed to address major challenges faced by Asian business owners in starting and growing their businesses. With your support, we will keep launching marketing campaigns and beautification projects, providing small business trainings and information sessions, developing websites, social media, education and engaging in advocacy at the state and local levels and in the media. The relationship we built up through our Flushing office enables us to organize and activate the small business community quickly when challenges arise. With the recent increase in enforcement of commercial signage regulations, we were able to quickly inform the small business owners about the rules and regulations being enforced and organize rallies and propose solutions to the city council to adopt to help small business become compliant and reduce their burden of compliance. We are grateful for the City Council's quick response to the signage issue with the Awning Act and look forward to working with the Council and the City to ensure small businesses have compliant signage without onerous costs. I do want to add one thing that after the signage, uh, uh, many signs were taken down. A lot of the customers were not even able to locate the small businesses anymore. So quickly our organization was able to put up a temporary sign for the small business owners and we have uh, recently launched design signage replacement program in order to help all the small business owners who need to get the permit from the DOB. Thank you. Do you have many small businesses that were targeted um, and received violations and fines? So uh, in our jurisdiction, uh, according to my best of my knowledge, there were two sections which include six small businesses that has been ticketed. Uh, that the first one was at December 2018 and the second one was at January 2019. So and. Uh, 
since then, uh, the, the whole block, the business owners were pretty much fear, had, had fear. So they all started taking down each signage that they had to take down was about 400 to $800. And which means when they have to reinstall the sign, it's gonna cost another four to $800. If they need a permit, that's gonna be another $2,600. And the actual awning or any electronic signs is gonna cost two or 2,500 to $5,000. That's gonna include at least $10,000 for each small business owners. I want you to stay in touch with me because I want to be helpful to those businesses that did receive the violations and then maybe collectively we can work on the bill that we just passed. Uh, maybe there may be an opportunity for you, so please stay in touch with me. Thank you so much. And the bill was great. It helped a lot. So, it, it, Unfortunately, it was a little too late for some businesses. Yes. Yes. I want to thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, hearing has officially ended. Thank you, folks.